Hello, my name is Mario. Welcome to another Go video. In today's episode, I'm sharing with you five tips for writing idiomatic code in Go. Tip number one, when using context, it should be the first parameter in your arguments. As usual, the link to all the examples that I'm going to be showing you are in the description of this video, so feel free to check it out. So we are going to be looking at context and specifically a few different ways that you can use context and, you know, the idiomatic way to do that in particular so we have three fun two, two functions functions and the first one will be idiomatic uh, function called parse idiomatic the second one will be parse not idiomatic and this is an example obviously i'm not doing anything in the functions for now but the idea is that when you're implementing functions that happen to be using the context type specifically coming from the context package it should be the first argument and i'm going to explain you why if you define those as the second argument or the last argument obviously the compiler would not complain or fail or give you a warning or nothing like that it's just that the guidelines and the community and the practices that we're following as code developers tell us that we should be using it as the first argument now why because if you think of how the context works is when you receive a request for example an http request it will be a context which indicates uh, values that are coming that declare i don't know i don't know cancellation instrumentation values um, things that, uh, along those lines then you can pass down across the multiple layers and the multiple functions that you have in your code it's a way to clearly indicate where this is coming from uh, where it should be going if we define and we say, hey, we want to save that context that we're receiving in the, in the request and save it into a field, like the way I have right here in a function called not idiomatic, what it's going to be doing is giving you uh, a way to, it's going to be confusing because one, you're saving that context that remember is supposed to be living only for that specific request and it's not going to be saved across multiple requests. And if you have to, def if you're defining if a value of variable that happens to be using this type and you assign a context that is only applicable to one request and you handle millions of requests then it will be confusing and not only that if that happens to be con cancelled or completed it will not be valid anymore again keep context as the first argument and do not as much as possible save it as a field in your structure or in your types now there is a there is a linter that allows you to re, to to, the, to validate this called uh, revive that it's included in the goldline ci linter uh, meta linter that you can uh, run by itself you just have to enable it because by default is i believe it's not included it's not enabled by default so you have to enable all and don't worry about this i use this disable the ones that are giving you warnings uh, but other than that if you run the Golan CI run, it will detect, in this case, the parse it not idiomatic function that is not following the convention that we should be using when using context. Tip number two, return early. Let me show you the code so this makes more sense. So I have this example that it's uh, implementing a function called parse value that receives a value, a value type that implements three fields must tr be true, my message and priority. Now what it does in size, it really doesn't matter too much. In the end, what I'm trying to just do is return a function, uh, <laughs> return a function, return a string that happens to be using those fields as a string. Now, what you're seeing right here is the opposite of what we should be doing and the most typical example with return early is when you're using errors for example if i'm using an error uh, we return immediately and we don't use the else function which is the opposite of what i'm doing right here i mean this works but this is not idiomatic so what will we what should we be doing instead of doing this what should we be doing is taking the code and getting rid of the else we save and we get rid of the else we go back and again we get rid of the else and we just add a space right here so i mean it may not look like a lot of things change but the, a lot of things change so if you notice is that we can see that everything is sort of easier to follow because you can notice that you can determine immediately by just looking at the code when things stop in the context of the flow of the function and this not only applies to when dealing with errors but if you have a piece of code that you can rewrite in a way that you can return immediately if the validations don't satisfy what the inputs that you're receiving it makes the code easier to understand or to rephrase it instead of having an if 
and then a whole context of code that implements the, the, the function itself, you can do the opposite. And instead of doing that, return immediately and then do what you have to do below that. So which this is what we're trying trying to do here. And I hello this doesn't only apply to Go specifically. This is clearly something that the authors intended to do. It makes I think the code much more easy to understand and read. But this can be applied to another languages. I don't typically use else unless I have to. For example, I need to assign a variable uh, because there are two different conditions, or maybe I need to call a function that doesn't necessarily affect the result of the function that is being called from. Uh, but typically, I won't be. I don't usually use else to be honest with you. So this is a thing, in my opinion, an easy way to handle these conditionals and the different branches that you have in your code. Let's jump into tip number three. Avoid the init function at least 99.9% .9 of the time. So the init function is an interesting thing because it allows you to initialize global variables or global functions or do something with the global state. But you also need to understand that anything that has global state is harder to test and it can give you some nasty errors when dealing with concurrency. However, with that being said, what I'm trying to tell you here and the recommendation that I want to share with you is that when you're building your APIs and your code in Go, try to avoid having the need to use init in your own code that you're writing. Not the code that is coming from the standard library. The code that is coming from the standard library, it is the way it is, and maybe one day it will be changed. Now, specifically for this example, I have this main that is importing first and second and using the blank import, which is literally this underscore line right here. Uh, so if I go and jump into the implementation of first, you will notice that it's having a, an init function. And if I jump into the implementation of second, you will notice that it's also having an init function. Now, what is happening as well is in first, I not only have the first file, first.go file, but also have an a.go file. And what this a.go file is just prints out a from or first from a. So if I go and look at again at second, you will notice that second is, do, is doing something similar and main is just literally that doing that. So what I'm doing is that if I go and run go main, you will notice that it's going to be printing out a few, a few different uh, details that are coming from the different files. Now, <clears throat> like I said, in A, we have first from A, first has an implementation that says uh, uh, multiple init, and second also has a call to init as well. Now, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is one, you can initialize or call init multiple times in the package. The way that this implement that the way that those are called are literally by the way they were defined in the first place. So if you notice, I have my file called A and it's being printed first. And the reason it's being printed first is because first alphabetically is the first one. Now, if I go second will be the second one. And if I do an LS first, you will notice that A goes first and therefore first package is going to be imported first the second one will be a and then the first go file will be also loaded so the sequence that i'm getting is the sequence that you can see right here now if i go and modify first a let's say i want to move first a and move it to first i don't know something that goes before after let's say z if i run this again you will notice that now the order is different now instead of running first first or rather a first you will notice that it's running afterwards so all the first dot go file inits are running first then the the they need that is coming from the z dot go file and finally from the second now this is a super simple example now consider this when you're building a program a package or whatever the case may be and you're importing a bunch of different things and those import packages that happen to be using init behind the scenes. What is going to happen? Well, we don't know because it depends on how these packages are being imported and where the files are located. 
Not only that, it, it, it makes, like I said, it makes testing much more difficult. However, I understand that in the standard library, this is how things are, like packages like, for example, database uh, SQL and image define methods uh, for registering concrete implementations that allow you to extend logic that is defined in the original package. That's why you see when you port in a database driver that you can you need to use for connecting to a database, a relational database, you need to do a blank import most of the times. If you're dealing with images like PNG, JPEG, and those kind of things, you also have to explicitly those load those packages using the blank import. Thus, this is something that ideally you as the as an author of a third party you should be doing, but rather thinking this in a different way and not use global state for defining things like this. So let's jump into tip number four. Comments are for humans and for machines. Let me show you what I mean by this. I have an example that is coming from the Todo microservice uh, repository that I've been using for describing how to build microservices in Go. Specifically, what I want to show you is just a small tiny difference, but in the end, um, as if you keep seeing this consistently you will notice and you will be trained by just ignoring those specific comments when you're looking for documentation in your code documentation that is meant to be used for humans let me give you a concrete example so i have these two lines one will be the go generate uh, command that is being called when you call go generate and this counterfeiter generate that is called also when you're calling go generate now, the biggest difference between this and the one that says provider is that there is a the small space right here. And you will notice, you will say, hey, but this doesn't really make a big difference. It does, because these comments, if I decide to, for example, uh, add a no lint right here, and let's say, I don't know, I'm trying to not lint revive, just, just an example, this comment will not be included in the documentation in Go, in the Godoc documentation, all the PKG, uh, dev go dev uh, website and more important more importantly it allows us as developers to immediately notice what are the comments that are supposed to be uh, applicable to the machine which in this case will be maybe go generate go build go, uh, uh, the linters those kind of things that don't necessarily add uh, they do add details to the implementation but that they don't necessarily add details to the information that is going that is supposed to be for the humans that we're reading the code again this is a small tiny example it's a small tiny thing but it, ideally you can tell the difference between comments that are supposed to be going for the tools for the for the machine and comments that are supposed to be um, directed to the humans let's jump into the last one tip number five avoid unnecessary functions for this one, let's look at the code. I have a file called main.go that defines a type called user that defines two fields. One will be name and birth year. And this one also defines uh, functions. One of them will be a new user function and the other two will be two methods that are used for the user type. Now, what I mean by not implementing unnecessary functions depends on what your types are being used for. For this specific example, if you notice, I define a constructor here called new user. You know, it's not a constructor as in a sense of another programming languages. This is a convention that the Go community came up with, with defining a new function that happens to be using the type name that is applied to. For example, in this case, I'm calling it new user, which returns a user. In some cases, there are uh, another ways to define initializers of constructors that include the width and the word that indicates much more concrete arguments that apply to the initialization of your type. In this case, I'm initializing a type that is using exported fields. And this is redundant because one, I'm not adding a validation at all. And two, because they are exported, why is even this function necessary? You know what I'm saying? I can literally replace this piece of code. Let's say I define a main function. This user, uh, let's say 900, and name will be Mario. So this initialization is equal to doing user name 
and birth year 1900. I mean, sure, you can define an initializer, but if you are exporting fields, you don't need this. You, you can get rid of that. And you shouldn't be defining that in the first place. Is the less code that you have, the better. Second one would be something similar. I have a function called get birth year. And this goes back to what you usually define in, again, another programming languages, when you define getters and setters. In this case, that is not even necessary because, again, this function that I'm using is referring to an exported field, so it's redundant. Again, I can get rid of this because I don't need it, and similarly with the other functions. So, this doesn't mean that you cannot define is constructor, constructors or initializers or getters or getters or setters. What I'm trying to say here is that it literally depends on the use case and you shouldn't be just blindly implementing methods and whatnot. There's a function, there's a function. There is a video I recorded called functional options or functional arguments that I will be leaving in linking in the description of this video as well. So you can, you know, check that out and refer to that one as well because it includes um, I, I, what I believe will be a clean way to define not only validations when you are initializing a type but also a way to add defaults and things similar like that thank you for watching and hopefully all these five tips help you to write more idiomatic code in go i will talk to you next time okay take care and stay safe bye bye